Well, hey, today we are going to be jumping into the Word of God. Everybody okay with that? All right. So if you're new with us today, we, we are on a journey throughout the year of 2020 to read through the entire New Testament, and that is how we're kind of breaking our message topics up uh, throughout the year. Uh, we are exploring right now the life of Jesus, and over the past four weeks, we've been talking about kind of the beginning uh, of Jesus' ministry. We've talked about his baptism, his temptation, uh, the, the launch of his mission, and then the calling of disciples. And today we're going to shift gears. And for the next couple weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the miracles of Jesus. Over the next four weeks, we are going to spend some time uh, diving into God's word and observing some of the miraculous things that, that Jesus did. You know, when it comes to the miracles of Jesus, uh, we, we've got to view them in, in a special way. Um, it's easy to be wowed by the miraculous things that, that happen in the Bible. The, it's easy to, to view uh, all the things that Jesus did uh, in this, this miraculous way um, and still miss the purpose of the miracles. And so what we're going to do is we're going to really try to find the deeper meaning in, in some of these miracles that took place um, and I hope you enjoy this journey that we've been on. If you want to keep up with reading through the New Testament on our website, we have daily readings. You can just go to the reading plan and each day we post a new reading for you that will get you through the New Testament uh, and all of the book of Proverbs, which is a book of wisdom uh, in the year of 2020. So we'd love for you to follow along with that. If you have your Bibles today, though, we are going to look at a very specific miracle. It's a, kind of a two for one, if you will. Uh, Jesus performs two miracles uh, in the same uh, scenario or the same kind of context in which um, he was operating. And so we're going to talk today about a sick daughter and a suffering woman. You may want to write that down or, or write those verses down. This is where you can find this particular uh, miracle in Matthew chapter 9, verse 18 through 26, Mark chapter 5, 21 through 43, and Luke chapter 8, 40 through 56. And you can read all the different gospel accounts. If you're new to the Bible, listen, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the account of the life of Jesus. Um, they all kind of tell the life of Jesus from a different vantage point, from a different angle. And so um, as you're reading through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's a lot of the same uh, stories just kind of told from a different viewpoint. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look at Mark chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. And that's what we're going to read today. Uh, I'll give you some context to this. Mark um, is, is gone through in the previous chapters talking about some of the messages that Jesus has spoken and then uh, a few of the miracles that have taken place prior to this particular one. And so Jesus has performed this stuff on one side of a lake and then the Bible tells us that he travels back to the other side of this lake and that's where we'll pick up in Mark chapter 5 verse 21 and the Bible tells us this. Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. When a leader of the local synagogue, if you don't know what a synagogue is, it's kind of like the local church of the time. The local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so that she can live. Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. And she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Now Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out of him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing in around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. 
Go in peace. Your suffering is over. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There is no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all of this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him. But he made them leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was laying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha Koum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And then he told them to give her something to eat. God, this morning, as we approach your word, your holy, perfect, unchanging word, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit this morning, that you would speak to us. That God, through this miraculous event that took place, God, you would open our eyes and open our hearts and open our minds to have a greater understanding of who Jesus is and who you desire us to be. We love you. We thank you. We give this time to you. Speak to us now in the name of Jesus. Amen. When you you look at this particular story, this miracle that took place, There's a lot of details and there's a number of things that I think need to be noted about the two individuals uh, that received the miracle. You have Jairus, the the temple leader, the synagogue leader, and and this is a guy who uh, in his community, in his city, in his his town, in his community, he he was well known. People would have known who Jairus was. People would have looked to him for advice and for guidance and for for spiritual consultation and and all of those types of things. He was was wealthy. He was respected. And over the past 12 years of his life with his daughter, he had probably experienced a whole lot of happiness seeing this little girl be born and this little girl uh, take her first steps and say her first words. And uh, my wife and I are kind of in that mode right now. Our baby boy is going to be one years old in uh, a couple weeks. And, and right now he is as wild as could be. And he is trying to talk and all he does is nonstop. And, and it's amazing, right? So Jairus has now spent these 12 years getting to spend time with his daughter, loving his daughter, seeing her develop, seeing her grow. The woman, on the other hand, She's unknown. She's a nobody, if you will. Nobody knows who this woman is. Nobody knows her name. In fact, her name isn't even mentioned in Scripture. She's unknown. She's poor. She has spent all of her money trying to find a cure for this illness that she is dealing with. Uh, And and what makes that even worse is that she has been disregarded. You see, the illness that she had, the condition that she was going through um, by... Uh, ancient law would prohibit her from going to the place of worship, uh, having community with people. She wouldn't have been allowed to join a group because she was considered unclean. And so not only had she lost her dignity, there was probably a good chance that she had lost her husband because of this. There was all different situations and scenarios that she was facing, probably a lot of friends, all the community she had. And so she was a disregarded person, not a known person. And over the past 12 years of her life, she had experienced nothing but misery. Here you have these two contrasting people that Jesus has this encounter with, but they did have one thing in common. Though they were totally different uh, in the realm of how people viewed them, they had one thing in common. They both experienced tragedy. You see, one of the things about life that I think we're all painfully aware of, I think it's really the tragedy of life, is that we can't avoid tragedy. All of us will experience tragedy. I was reminded of that this past Sunday. I had left church and I was 
pulling into uh, the parking lot of the grocery store. My wife had asked me to pick a few things up before I, I got home, and, and I'm, my phone is blowing up with text messages. And I'm like, why is my phone blowing up with text messages? Like, it was a great day at church, like, but usually I don't get this many text messages. And so I begin opening these, these messages, and, and there is these headlines and these news uh, about what had happened to Kobe Bryant, his daughter, and the seven other people on, on that helicopter. If you've watched any TV this week or you're on social media, there's no way to avoid the news about this. And, and I don't want to talk about this in, in any deep particular way, but, but it was tragic, unexpected. Nobody had thought that that would happen. Nobody on that helicopter that day got on that ride that was probably taken numerous times and expected this tragedy to take place. And I only say that because it is tragic. And as we journey through this world, every day we turn on the TV, every day that we're operating in this life, there are tragic things that happen. Wouldn't we agree? And there's no way to explain them. And there's no real answers for them, and so it begs the question, right, which maybe you've asked, maybe I've asked, but I know a whole lot of people in the world have asked, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Anybody ever thought about that before? Let's just be honest. I know in church, maybe that's like a dangerous question. We shouldn't question God. Guess what? God's big enough for all of our questions. Like, we should just settle in our hearts that it's okay to be angry with God. It's okay to be upset when things don't happen the way that we thought that they would happen. It is okay to be hurt and to go through pain and to even question God, why is this happening? God's big enough to handle all of that. God is all-knowing. He knew the questions we would have. He knew the concerns that we would have about these tragic things that happen in life. And so let me tell you this this morning. I do not have a definitive answer for that question. I don't have a definitive answer. I wish as your pastor today I could stand on this stage and say, listen, this is why bad things happen in life. But I don't. I don't have a definitive answer for that. But here's what I would like to suggest today. So if you're taking notes and you really want to maybe ponder this outside of this message today... Uh, I would challenge you to do so. Here's what I would like to suggest to us as a church today. God allows tragedy so that we can better grasp his majesty. The word majesty means impressive dignity or beauty. I also believe that God allows a temporary bad so that we will pursue an eternal good. I'm going to spend the next few moments talking about this because the truth is, though it doesn't mean that we won't experience pain or hurt or fear or frustration, disappointment, discouragement, anger, all of the things that come along with tragedy, it does mean, though, that even in the midst of our worst situations, There is a Savior who wants to show us who he is. In the worst of the worst situations in your life, I stand firmly confident that there is a Savior who wants to show you in the midst of it all who he is. see, as I said earlier, as we look at the miracles of Jesus, what we have to do is we have to try to understand the deeper purpose uh, of them, especially this particular miracle. Yes, Jesus brought Jairus' daughter back to life. Yes, Jesus healed the woman uh, of bleeding. And listen, you, you better believe that their life was changed and transformed forever. This moment that they experienced had significant and profound effect on them. I guarantee it. How could you not be in that room knowing that your daughter was dead and seeing her come back to life? How could that not radically change and transform you? How could you not, as this woman, reach out and just in faith touch the edge of Jesus' robe and instantly be healed? Know that for 12 years you've been suffering and immediately it, it, it was all gone. These people's lives were radically changed and transformed by this experience with Jesus. But if all we do 
is stand in awe of this miracle that took place for them instead of understanding really how it happened, we're missing the whole point of the miracle. You see, you cannot control the tragedies that happen to you in life. Jairus had no control over his daughter dying. This woman had no control over the medical condition that she was facing. If we were to say, by a show of hands, how many of you have experienced tragedy? You don't have to raise your hand. I believe that everyone in this room would say that they've experienced tragedy to some extent. Tragedy is not just the losing of a loved one. Tragedy could be the losing of a job, the losing of a friend, a difficult situation that you faced. Any number of things could be tragedy in our life. And all of us have experienced tragedy and we have no answer to why or no control over to why we have faced whatever tragic situation it is. But here's what we do have control over. We have control of how we respond to that tragedy. We may not be able to control the things that happen in our lives, but we have total control of how we respond to them. And how we respond to tragedy determines whether or not we will have victory. How you and I respond to the tragic things in life will have the determination of whether we experience victory in them. And so here's what we have to do when we are faced with tragedy. And I want you to write this down because this will lead into what we're going to talk about for the remainder of our time. We have to let the devastating things in life cause us to have a desperation for Christ. When we face tragedy, no matter what degree it is, whatever devastation that we face in this life, if we want to be victorious, if we want to come out on the other side of it the way God wants us to come out of it, we have to develop a desperation for Jesus in the midst of whatever devastating things that we face. Jairus, the tragedy of losing a child, tragic. This woman suffering from this medical condition, it was a tragedy devastating but here's what they both did they both passionately unapologetically relentlessly desperately pursued Jesus you see the woman shouldn't have even been in the crowd if people would have known her condition, they would have told her that you need to be outside of this group of people. You are unclean. You are unworthy. How could you even imagine approaching this holy, amazing rabbi, teacher, instructor, man of God? Desperately, unapologetically went after Jesus. If I could just touch his robe. Jairus, prior to his daughter being sick, there's a very good chance he didn't want anything to do with Jesus. You see, because his peers, the religious leaders of the day, were not for Jesus. They were trying to find every reason to keep Jesus out of the synagogues. They were trying to silence Jesus. They thought Jesus was some radical that was disrupting everything that they had established. They were jealous of Jesus, and so Jairus, whether or not he thought Jesus was a good dude or not, was probably very leery about Jesus coming to his town and causing this uproar of all this gathering of people, but things change when you face tragedy. Jairus forgot about his stand, status in the community. He forgot about his status in his group of peers, his religious leaders, and what did he do? He passionately, unapologetically desperately went after Jesus to the point of saying, I'm going to throw myself on the ground at the feet of this man and say, please, come touch my daughter. But I think as we explore this miracle, there is something that, that we have to understand about it. 
is that in the midst of tragedy for you and I, Jesus can do a miracle. There's no doubt about it. Any tragic thing that you face, anything that you go through, Jesus can do a miracle. Jesus can heal. Jesus can restore. Jesus can raise dead things back to life. Whatever tragedy you are facing in this moment or tragedies that you face throughout your lifetime, because we will face them, Jesus can do a miracle. But you know what's more important than receiving a miracle? Getting closer to Jesus. You see, Jairus would have never known Jesus without tragedy. The woman would have never known Jesus without tragedy. And listen, I have found in my life, in the painful moments, in the pain, the hurt, the disappointment, frustration, anger, in those moments of my life, in the tragedies that I, I, I have gone through in my life, I have found myself desperately wanting Jesus to do a miracle. And there have been many situations and circumstances in my life where I didn't think Jesus was responding with a miracle. But as I look back on my life and I look back on the most difficult things in my life where the miraculous did not happen, I find myself on the other side of those disappointments, those tragedies, those discouragements closer to Jesus. Jesus can do a miracle. He has the ability and the power to do a miracle. But what if he doesn't? What if he doesn't? What if he doesn't show up miraculously in your marriage? What if he doesn't show up miraculously in your finances? What if he doesn't show up miraculously in your illness? How are you going to respond to it? You see, because how you respond to tragedy determines the outcome of your tragedy. And what Jesus wants in the outcome of every tragedy is for you to know him more. And so what do we do in tragedy? And what, I guess really, how do we allow ourselves to get to a place in the midst of the devastating things to, to turn into this desperation for Jesus. If we allow that to happen, I, I can guarantee you there will, be, there will be a few things that take place. If you allow in your life as you go through tragedy, difficulty, pain, circumstances, if you will allow it to become something that drives you to desperately, passionately, unapologetically pursue Jesus I want to guarantee three things will happen. That's pretty bold, Landon. Going to guarantee it. Seal of approval. The pastor said it. Guaranteeing these things will happen in the midst of your tragedy. If, listen, if you allow the devastation to turn into desperation for Jesus. These things won't happen if you just chase after whatever it is you want to chase after. If you go after advice that people give you or you listen to whoever is on the latest podcast or whatever it may be. Listen, these things only take place when you desperately go after Jesus in the midst of your tragedy. And the first is this. Here's what I guarantee. Jesus is going to be there. If you will passionately pursue Jesus... In your tragedy, in your devastation, Jesus is going to be there. Psalm chapter 34 verse 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirit is crushed. Matthew chapter 11 verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me. All of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Jesus is saying, come to me. Passionately, desperately pursue me. Bring me your pain. 
bring me your hurt, bring me your brokenness, bring me your frustrations, bring me your questions, bring me your anger, bring me whatever it is that you need to bring to me. I am big enough, I am strong enough, I am holy enough to carry it all. Come to me. When you're facing the marriage issue, when you're facing the financial issue, when you're facing the illness, when you're facing the death of a loved one, when you're facing whatever it is that you are facing, come to me. I don't want you to carry this on your own. I am here to help you. And yes, I know you don't understand why you're going through it, but it will all become clear at some point. But you got to come to me because I can help you carry that burden. I can help you carry that pain. And in fact, I don't want to just help you. I want to take it from you. You see, because when you passionately pursue Jesus, not only is he going to be there, I can guarantee you this, Jesus is going to bring peace. Jesus is going to bring peace to the situation and the circumstances that you face if you passionately pursue him. Philippians Chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And in John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give you is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Sometimes we look at these verses for the less than difficult scenarios of our life. God's word fits into every scenario of our life. The reason so many people, though, often don't experience this peace in the midst of tragedy is because they pursue everything else first and leave God as the last resort. But if we will focus our eyes and focus our attention and focus all of our heart in the midst of the most difficult things that we go through in life on Jesus, the Bible says the author and the perfecter and the finisher of our faith, if we will focus our eyes on Jesus and we will pursue him, he will be there and he will bring a peace that surpasses all understanding. You will have people questioning and asking, how are you so calm in this scenario? How are you dealing with this? And your only answer will be, I don't know. It's got to be Jesus. I guarantee Jesus will be there. I guarantee Jesus is going to bring peace. And I guarantee... Jesus is going to work things out. Listen, you may not get rid of all the pain and all the hurt, all the anguish. You may actually live the rest of your life with hurt, with sorrow, with pain, disappointment, discouragement. But you better believe Jesus is going to work things out. John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus tells us, Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. I'm going to call the band up as we get ready to wrap up, but I also want to read to you Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. You see, it may not all be clear, on this side of eternity, you may go your whole life wrestling with questions. You may go your whole life trying to understand. But if you keep passionately pursuing Jesus, even if on a daily basis you have to say, Jesus, I don't understand, but I'm still coming after you because I know you're here and I know you're the only one that can bring peace and I'm going to live in confidence that you're going to work it out. You know what the Bible says in Revelation 21 verse 4? It says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. 
all these things are gone forever. You know, I want to wrap up by reading a story of a young lady in our church. This is in her own words. I asked her to write this for me. Her name's Ellie. My parents were both recovering alcoholics when I was born. I was told things were good until they started drinking again, and that is the first time, to my knowledge, my mom attempted suicide. See, shortly after they stopped drinking, they began to have marriage issues, and my mom decided to move back to Ohio to be close to her family. After moving, she divorced my dad. We weren't there long before my mom started to drink again, which eventually led to drugs and promiscuity. When our family found out, my older sister was sent to live with her father, and that was the first time I was sent to live with my aunt. My mom went to rehab. After her stay in rehab, I went back to live with my mom. And it wasn't long until the drinking and the drugs started again. As young as three years old, I was being left at home alone. While she went out stripping and getting high. As her using worsened, she would sleep through the day, forgetting me at the daycare most days. After many incidences, the daycare eventually called the police. I was then removed from my mom's custody and sent to live with my dad in South Carolina. Things began to get better. He was going to AA and I started pre-K at Ridge Christian Academy. And that's where I first was introduced to God. We soon began to attend church at the school I love going to the kids' classes, and I look back on these years as the best years of my childhood. Then in April of 2008, when I was five years old, my mom took her own life. Being still so young, I didn't understand the depth of my loss, but I knew it hurt. My life began to unravel fast. My dad fell into a deep depression and began drinking again heavily. He bounced between houses, and because of his depression, drinking, and his own suicide attempts, we'd been evicted from several living arrangements, and it wasn't long before we were no longer attending church. The season of my life was an up and down roller coaster of empty promises from him to stop drinking. We ended up living in a campground in a small camper my grandparents helped us get. Then in 2011, when I was nine years old, my dad was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, only making things worse for us. After being denied disability several times, my dad began to say, there is no God. If there were, why would this be happening? As a child, I was confused, but because he was my dad, I went along with it. Although I still kept my Bible. Between 2011 and 2015, I cannot count the number of times my dad attempted suicide or even talked about doing it. I felt angry, distressed, lost. During those times, I felt this urge to go to my Bible to find verses about how I was feeling, always having to hide it from my dad. But when I would read it, it would always reassure me that things would somehow be okay. In September of 2015, at the age of 13, things really took a turn for the worse. My father attempted suicide again, and I went to the police. It wasn't the first time, but this time was different. They took me to a foster home. The next day, my dad took his own life. Two days later, I was starting a new life in Texas my aunt, uncle, and cousins. And on Sunday, 
we went to church. I started to feel a yearning for a closer relationship with God, but wasn't sure what to do about it. In February of 2019, we started to attend Trademark Church, and it felt like fate. I started serving in Trademark Kids, and when Trademark students started in September, after the first two weeks, I knew this is where I was supposed to be. On November 13th, at one of the Trademark student events, I felt compelled to again, this time with full understanding, surrender my life to Jesus and start living for Him. And on January 5th, 2020, I was baptized, surrounded by my family and friends. And what made this day even more special is that my sister, who had flown in that morning, made the decision to give her life to Jesus during the service and was baptized with me. Ellie's life has been tragic. But when you allow the tragedy in your life, the devastation of your life, to cause you to have a desperation for Jesus, everything changes. I don't know where you find yourself today. I don't know what you find yourself going through, facing, struggling with. But I want you to know that Jesus is there, that he will bring peace, and that he will work it all out. This morning, we are going to be baptizing people. And if you've never been baptized, maybe today's the day that you say, I'm going to surrender my life to Jesus. Despite my past, despite my background, despite my shortcomings or the things that I have faced in my life, today I'm going to make a decision to surrender it all to Jesus. I am going to desperately, passionately, unapologetically go after him. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. If you're ready to go all in for Jesus, today's the day. We have a number of people that are going to be baptized. We have the shirt, we have the shorts, we have everything that you need to be baptized this morning. I'm going to pray, and when I'm done praying, I'm going to count to three. And if you want to be baptized, I would like for you to come join me down front. God, I thank you for what you're doing in this place. I thank you for the transforming power that comes from knowing Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, that you always meet us in our circumstances, that you bring peace that surpasses all understanding, and that you always work things out. This morning, I pray, God, that if there is anyone in this room this morning that needs to surrender it all to you, that they would be bold enough to come forward and to be baptized today. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.